Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out. Today we have Alyssa and she's the CEO of Nomad Creative. And she's here to discuss, uh, and she's a branding specialist to help show you and show you the value of proper branding. And I will pass this now over to Alyssa. Oh, I also wanna let you guys know, just re remain on mute. Uh, throughout the webinar. Uh, if she asks you to unmute, you can do so. Um, and you're more than welcome to keep your camera on as we will be recording for this entire webinar. So if you think this is a great webinar um, to pass on to another coworker or another business, you're more than welcome to do so. I will send the email out as soon as it's downloaded to YouTube. And now I'll pass it over to Alyssa. Amazing. Well, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, First off, I'm super excited to be here sharing with you all today. And I just wanted to thank you for registering for this webinar. Um, also special thanks to the Small Business Center and Trenville for set setting this up and having me. As um, Brianna mentioned, my name is Alyssa Zwanek and as you may have gathered, the founder and CEO of Nomad Creative. So just to give you a little bit of a background, Nomad Creative is a remote creative agency and What's cool about our business model is that we bridge the gap between traditional agencies and freelancers in that we provide teams of specialized remote creators to businesses locally and globally. So in other words, no overhead costs whatsoever, which is pretty awesome. We work on projects in marketing, branding, social media, and everything in between. And since 2018, we've grown our team of freelancers to over 50 creatives across all disciplines. We've had the opportunity to work with some major brands such as David's Tea, the Aldo Group, Campbell's Canada, and many more. Though we do have some cool names in our repertoire, our primary focus is really on branding and rebranding for small to mid-sized businesses. So enough about me. I'd love to learn a little bit about you. Um, my goal is to interact with you all as much as possible throughout this call. So I'll be asking you to participate by typing in the chat from time to time. There are no wrong answers. The questions and activities are really just to keep you guys engaged and interested. So first off, tell me, what is your current role? Type it in the chat. Um, what do you do for work? I'd love to know. Are you maybe a solopreneur, freelancer, CEO, employee of a company? Maybe you're just interested in learning more about branding and potentially starting your own business, which is great. Let me know. Cool, Anna, paralegal, UI artist here. Hey, Marie-Ève, how are you? Good, you? <laughs> good, good, <laughs> thanks for joining. My pleasure, I'm excited. Great, employee, awesome, lead business consultant. Amazing, business student. Great, thank you guys for sharing, appreciate that. So awesome. Um, so you'll notice that I'll be referring to branding as your brand a lot, but that could be either a brand you work for, a brand of your own, or one that you aspire to build. So just kind of keep that in mind. So to jump into the agenda, today um, I'll be clarifying the difference between your logo and your brand. We'll talk about the importance of brand evolution and rebrands in 2022. Um, I'll also break down the core elements of branding and brand DNA, talk about um, how to convey your brand across all social media platforms, as well as why branding is one of the most important investments for your business. Okay, so in the first section, like I mentioned, we'll talk about the difference between your logo and your brand, and we'll do that by digging into what branding really is. So type it in the chat. Don't think too much about it. What comes to mind when you think about what makes a brand? And we'll see what the general consensus is. What do you think a brand is? Type it in the chat, guys. Don't be shy. No wrong answers. We're not too sure, I see. <laughs> how they presented themselves to the audience, value, image, et cetera. Your overall image, a type of product, a statement of what your company does. Yeah, Ravi, great. Juliana, the underlying goal and vision, identity, 
Great. Yeah, these are all really awesome answers. And it seems like you guys have a pretty good, good grasp on, on what that is, actually, because, you know, the most common responses I usually get here are, you know, my, my brand is my logo, it's, it's my color palette, it's my fonts. And those answers are not wrong, but brands are much more than just the visual. Um, so by definition, a brand is an intangible marketing or business concept that helps people identify a company, product, or individual. People often confuse um, brands with things like logos, slogans, and other recognizable marks, but those are actually just marketing tools that help promote the goods and or services being offered by the business. So what a brand really is, is what people say about you when you're not in the room. It's how you leave customers feeling after interacting or experiencing your product or service. Think about that. All right, so next little exercise here to help you contextualize what we've just covered. Who can tell me what they see? I'm sure you're able to recognize the symbol, type it in the chat, what brand does this represent? Nike. Nike, right, easy. Great, thanks guys. So I can almost guarantee that every single one of you on this call were able to recognize this brand without even seeing the name, right? So what it really comes down to are these three elements and branding is all about recognition, perception and reputation. Some of the things you might wanna ask yourself about your brand or the brand that you work for in terms of recognition are, are people able to identify your brand? Two, perception, how are people understanding your brand? And three, reputation, are people having great experiences with your brand? So let's use Nike as an example. Looking at brand recognition, are people able to identify your brand? Now, as we mentioned, logo is one aspect, but what else comes to mind when you think about Nike? Well, it's an American athleisure company, right? It's most commonly recognized by its swoosh logo mark. They sell apparel, footwear, equipment, accessories for multiple different sports. We seem to know a lot by seeing so little. So the thing to take from this example is that you were able to put together who the brand is, what they sell, and how they look simply by recognizing their symbol. And what went behind Nike's strategy to create this awareness around their products and their services, that is called branding. So to dig a little deeper um, about perception, so how are people understanding your brand? With Nike, you can see that they are very inclusive in their marketing efforts where a slogan that they like to use is, if you have a body, you are an athlete. They pay attention to ethnicity, sex, age, and disability, for instance. And they believe, quote unquote, that diversity fosters creativity and accelerates innovation. So overall, the perception is quite positive. I would say even inspirational as well as innovative. People talk very highly of the brand and their offerings. Now, lastly, let's talk about reputation. So are people having great experiences with your brand? And a good way to gauge this is through things like reviews and testimonials, which of course Nike has tons of, but for the most part are very positive. Um, however, from a personal experience um, of let's say the Nike Run Club app um, to the excellent goods that they sell that people wear for years due to the quality, Nike's consistent effort to create excellent products and experiences is ultimately what drives the positive impact in communities and the environment, which I think is pretty admirable. And overall, I would say they have a pretty great reputation. Wouldn't you agree? So to quickly recap, yes, you all agree, awesome. <laughs> to quickly recap this section, branding is all about recognition, perception, and reputation. Does anyone have any questions so far before we move forward? Because I know we covered a lot of information very quickly. I'll give you guys a couple minutes. All right, so rolling into the next section. Now that we know what branding is, 
why should anyone ever rebrand? So any ideas, type it in the chat. Why do you think a business or individual would decide to rebrand? Is it because their logo is outdated? Maybe, but that's definitely not the only reason based on what we just discussed. What about how they talk, how they walk? Someone said change in management, current branding not resonating with the right audience, change in target audience, promote more business, being more creative. Excellent. Yeah, these are all really, really great answers. Thank you guys. Um, so we're going to come back to this question once we understand what rebranding is, but I think you guys are definitely on track. So to reiterate, we know that uh, branding is not just about the visual. So you can imagine that rebranding is much more than just updating the logo. It's an emotional shift. It's a change of direction. Now that can be a different type of service or experience to offer your customer or a completely new vision for where you want your company to go. It's a reaction to your customer's needs. Now listen to that again, a reaction to your customer's needs. This is why active listening to your clients and your customers is super, super important. It's really easy to, to turn a blind eye and pretend like everything is fine and doing good in business. And maybe it is to a degree, but is it the best it can do? Is good the best it can do? It's extremely difficult to admit where your brand's faults lie and where your brand may need to improve in order to stand out from its competitors in the market. So how do you know when it's time to consider rebranding? Listen, listen to your customers, listen to your clients, listen to the news, listen to your neighbors, listen to your community, listen to your competitors. Listen to your employees, your coworkers. What's going on around you? Is your brand as relevant as it once was? And could you be doing anything better to reach more people? I'm gonna repeat that last question once more because it's gonna really help drive um, the reasons for rebranding. So could you be doing anything better to reach more people? Oftentimes the answer is yes. Actively listening allows you to learn more about your brand, how people consume and interact with your brand and how your brand is perceived in the eyes of others. So it's really easy to feel clarity around a brand you personally feel you know so well because it's yours, right? Or you work for it. But do all the stakeholders have that same understanding of your brand's mission and message as you do? You don't know that, right? Listen to those stakeholders because you may be surprised at how little translates and how much more you could be doing to connect with them and in turn grow your business and your brand. So... The main reasons, back to this question, to rebrand is to form a stronger and better relationship with your customers. And this may be derived from a few different things. So first, a change of experience. Second, a reaction to active listening. Third, a reaction to something negative. And fourth, a change in mission or message. So a lot of you kind of hinted at a few of these, which is great. So definitely um, thinking in the right direction. Now, first off, why rebrand? So looking at a change in experience, we're gonna go through a few examples here. So perhaps you've made some changes in how your brand provides customer service. Take a restaurant, for example. They want to launch an app or a new website to accommodate the new digital generation so that reservations and takeout orders are available online. This restaurant is well-established. It's been around for years. And it's definitely very traditional, but now they want to communicate to a younger demographic in a way that they know how to communicate. So this will not only show customers that the restaurant cares about staying relevant and providing experiences that are reflective of those younger generation and their digital on-the-go lifestyle, but it also increases in-house efficiencies and reduces phone time and manual bookings. 
So in this case, it would be wise to rebrand in order to reflect this new change of experience. Changes, or sorry, chances are um, it being an older, more traditional restaurant, it would require a visual facelift as well as some updated messaging. So second would be a reaction to active listening. Now on the same note and using the, this example um, of this long time running traditional restaurant, a reason why they may have decided to create a change in experience is because of the active listening they had been doing. This restaurant it, you know, recognized that in order to stick around and compete with new restaurants around town, it had to do something to stand out and to accommodate the needs of the demographic that is now newly their primary customer. And so they realized that if they kept doing what they've been doing for all these years without evolving with the times, they would risk dissolving their reputation and eventually and potentially going out of business. And you know, brands are are really they're ever evolving, and as a rule of thumb, should be reevaluating um, every three to five years. Now, a third reason to rebrand may be propelled by a reaction to something negative. Now, I hope you're all giggling at my photo selections here because I really tried to be melodramatic. <laughs> Anyways. Perhaps the restaurant was receiving a lot of complaints about their phone lines um, only being open for limited hours, that it was really hard to reach them, which ultimately ended up resulting in lost reservations, which meant lost revenue. Potential customers were frustrated and the restaurant listened. So with a better system in place, the restaurant could ensure that all inquiring customs had the ability to reserve tables at any time from anywhere on their digital devices. Born was the online booking system, which resulted in a rebrand. Now, a fourth reason that would drive a rebrand is a change in your brand's mission or message. So let's say this restaurant recognizes that the potential to be more successful involves reevaluating who their target demographic is. It's possible that this changes several times throughout a brand's lifetime, especially as new competing businesses surface over time. And, you know, the restaurant knows that it's food and experience and service is excellent, but it's having a hard time communicating their value recently, right? So maybe that this is a sign that their tar target demographic is no longer behaving or consuming the information as they once did. Their changes of interest, behaviors, and expectations drove the restaurant to adapt with the times and stay relevant in the eyes of new consumers in the digital world. And the restaurant saw this as an opportunity to rebrand by reflecting on their message and their mission, <clears throat> which manifested in all the brand's collateral, including things like web design, menu design, interior design, and their overall marketing strategy. Now, if you take a look at this picture here, it's a timeline of McDonald's logo evolution since we've been talking about restaurants, you know? And let me talk to you briefly about their brand evolution. McDonald's was in the center of an obesity epidemic after multiple documentaries starred this chain, this fast food chain, blaming them as the source of the problem. So obviously this caused sales to drop, investors were not happy. And as a solution, what McDonald's did was decide to catch up on the current food market and introduce healthier choices. Remember when they started bringing like the wraps and the salads and all that stuff that was around that time. So by running a continuous rebranding cycle alongside allowed customers to identify the new brand image with the new food choices. And you could see, you know, it's a slight evolution, but it's there. And this is just the logo that we're showing, but we're also talking about, you know, who they're targeting, what they're offering. All of that has changed over time. So a brand should know that branding is all about what your consumers believe you do and how you make them feel. Now to recap, you know, rebranding may be driven by a few different things change of experience, reaction to active listening, reaction to something negative, change in mission or message. 
How's everybody doing? Any questions about rebranding before we move forward? Thank you, Elizabeth. <laughs> great. Well, I hope everything is clear so far. This is great. We have no questions. <laughs> All righty. <clears throat> Moving on to brand DNA. So now that we understand the concepts of branding and rebranding, let's dig into what they really entail. In this section, we're going to break down the core elements of branding, um, also known as brand DNA. So your DNA, your brand DNA, which typically mani manifests itself through a brand book, serves as a guide for every single business decision you'll ever make. Um, your DNA makes you a living, breathing brand. So I want you to think of your brand as a human being. What's its personality? Maybe it's goofy and playful, for example. How about its voice and tone? Perhaps it's lighthearted and comedic. What's its story? How did it come to be? You should also think about its mission, vision, values, along with what makes it unique, right? USP, unique selling proposition. So looking into personality, there are a few different systems developed to help categorize brand personalities. Um, one of which was designed by a behavioral psychologist. Her name is Jennifer Ackner. Um, it's great. This is the one that you're seeing on the left. She designed a framework that breaks down personality into five dimensions, and each of those contains a set of facets and traits. It's a little bit more complex to use, but it is super effective and thorough nonetheless. However, the model that we're going to look at today, which is what we use at um, our agency, Nomad Creative, is the 12 brand archetypes developed by Carl Jung. And he was a Swiss psychiatrist and psychoanalyst. So if we take a closer look here, the 12 archetypes are categorized in four groups, order, freedom, social, and ego, as you can see in that center circle. You can see that innocent sage and explorer fall under freedom. Hero, magician, and rebel fall under ego. Citizen, jet setter, and lover fall under social. And then ruler, caregiver, and creator fall under order. So in general, brands are able to recognize themselves under one archetype um, after understanding the definition of each. However, it is possible to be a combination of two, maybe three. Maybe... Um, you know, if you're interested in learning more, you can always just Google this chart. You'll find details description of, of each archetype. We'll go into a few of them, but not all of them because we'll be here forever. But it's definitely an interesting thing to look into. All right. Um, to help you understand these archetypes on a higher level, um, you can see some examples of renowned brands and where they sit in this diagram. So I'll let you take a moment to kind of observe this and then we'll break down a few examples here for you. Okay, so if we take a look at Pampers, for example, Pampers has become a symbol of love and care for mothers and mainly mothers, but also parents all around the world. Um, they fall under the caregiver brand archetype, which is super empathetic, compassionate, nurturing. It makes an excellent personality trait for um, healthcare brands, for instance, as well as nonprofits and baby products, of course looking at Pampers. Um, and aside from their incredibly cute advertisements and their thoughtful packaging and soothing visual style, um, they, regu they regularly publish educational content um, on their YouTube channel as well as on their website that helps customers um, care and protect for their family. So you can see in this screenshot, it's from one of their videos on YouTube, giving pointers about bath time. It sounds silly, but you have a kid you'll know <laughs> you can see how even their slogan love sleep and play fits right into that caregiver archetype now going into another example the explorer brand archetype 
which taps into their audience's desire to travel and discover new places and people, um, different worlds, things like that. They really love freedom. Um, and that can also be tied in with a sense of adventure. So Jeep is very famous for creating commercials that trigger audiences desire for adventure and exploring the world um, and really support the idea and the message that no matter how tough the terrain or how wild the adventure, Jeep is there with you on the exciting journey. Um, so you can see in this ad that Jeep is really up for any challenge, no matter what nature throws its way. It uh, positions the brand as brave, thrill-seeking, pretty straightforward. Now, the last example we'll go over here is the creator brand archetype, which is all about innovation and creativity. So these brands are typically non-conformist. Um, they're usually the first ones to introduce new technologies or create new combinations of features. Um, they're also problem solvers. And uh, they typically like to express themselves freely, creatively, while empowering and inspiring audiences. That's a big thing. So Apple, of course, has been the go-to example for innovation in design and technology for many years now. And if you take the MacBook Air, for example, as you see in the picture, back um, when it was introduced in 2018, it actually broke the record of being the world's thinnest notebook. Um, you know, they also do a really good job at encouraging people to express themselves by sharing content um, that they've created with their Apple devices and products. So you could see how they really encourage that creativity there. Now, jumping into a voice and tone, I think a lot of people confuse the two, even myself sometimes, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> so here is a simple way to differentiate them. So your voice is what describes your company's personality. It's consistent and it's unchanging. And your tone is the emotional inflection applied to your voice. So it can adjust um, to what's suitable for a particular piece or message you may be trying to communicate. And the most enduring companies really do have a strong personality and a clear sense of purpose. Their message is oftentimes deliver delivered um, consistently over all collateral and all channels um, because they have that established brand voice. So going back to Apple as an example, they do a really great job pairing powerful products with a confident voice. So whether it's on um, their website, TV ads, print ads, they always look clean. Um, the copy is always punchy. Generally, I would say that they could be described as clean, simple, and confident. So one way to help you define your voice and your tone, um, you can do this thing. It's called a uh, word this and not that exercise. Super simple, super straightforward, basically listing what you are and what you are not. So I'd like you guys to help me on this one. Since we're talking about Apple, let's use this one as an example. Type in the chat some keywords that you think describe who Apple is. So we're looking at what we are column on the left right now. And there's no wrong answers. We did just talk about them. So maybe it's fresh, top of mind. What are some words that would describe what Apple is? Type it in the chat. Ahead of the times, totally. Technology company, innovative leader, great. Thanks, Juliana. Thanks, Ravi. Okay, great. Now let's do the same thing for the other column. What we are not. What Apple isn't. Devin says they are lug luxury pro. They're not cheap. Thank you, Elizabeth. I would agree. Updated. We are not outdated. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Subpar, we are not subpar. Yeah, this is great. Excellent. Thank you guys for participating. So as you can see, a lot of those ideas that you shared with me came, came through as well when I, when I was doing this. So 
here are some description words that I pulled together for Apple. We are exciting, but not boring. We are innovative, not followers. Simple, not complex. Supportive, not unreliable. High quality, not cheap. Genuine, not misleading. Inspiring, not predictable. So you guys definitely got a lot of those. And there are many more that we can list out as well. Anyone have any questions so far about brand DNA? Don't be shy, put it in the chat. I like to break it up a little for you guys, give you an opportunity to think of anything as we go through it. Where to find that wheel you showed earlier with 12 things? Google it. Carl Jung archetypes. It's all over the internet. <laughs> And you could just type in even brand archetypes or brand personality. There's a few different methods in place, but those two that I showed are um, the most popular ones, I would say. You're welcome, Myla. Okay. So furthermore on brand DNA are mission, vision, values, and unique selling proposition. All of these elements, um, including the personality, tone, and voice help put together the pieces of the brand story. So your brand story is truly the reason the business exists and the guiding force to these specific brand DNA elements. So we're on the Apple train. To put all of these elements into context, we're gonna use Apple as an example because I think most, if not all of you are pretty familiar with this brand. We also just spoke about them a little. So in general, your mission is the purpose of your business for customers and employees. And Apple's mission statement reads, the company is committed to bringing the best user experience to its customers through its innovative hardware, software, and services. Pretty straightforward, right? Their vision statement is actually super long. So if you wanna look up Apple's vision statement, go for it. Um, but I did highlight a key phrase describing uh, how they see the future of the brand. And they say, we believe that we are on the face of the earth to make great products and that's not changing. They go on to say that they are constantly focusing on innovating. They believe in sim the simple and not the complex, that um, they, they don't settle for anything less than excellence and every group of the company. And they make it very clear that they're not going anywhere and that they will always continue to push the boundaries. Right, they say, and that's not changing. Now, your values are the qualities you value in your culture, which helps set the tone for your brand. And Apple's value proposition leverages the, these three mottos think different, tech that works, and your privacy is safe with us. So, if you think about Apple as a whole and the type of services and products that they provide, you can probably check each of these statements off as valid, right? All right, so Apple, um, for example, is known for their sleek state-of-the-art design, user-friendly products, reliability, innovation, and being a cool alternative to the PC. This is their unique selling proposition. So if Apple came out with a series of dirt cheap laptops that didn't have that unique MacBook style that's super sleek and that, you know, people are used to, do you think that customers would be happy given that they've come to now expect a certain quality and standard from Apple? Yeah, Juliana says, not at all. I don't think so. Customers would most likely become frustrated, right? They might even turn to competitors and be like, hey, I don't like what Apple's doing anymore. Let me see if there's something else better out there. So pulling a stunt like this could actually really hurt Apple as a brand because, <clears throat> excuse me, their specific unique selling proposition that helped them stand out would no longer define the company. The very foundation of the brand would crumble. So this is super important to stand by. All right, <clears throat> so as you can see, all of these elements that we just covered create your brand DNA and a strong brand brand has a really deep foundation for growth 
and the future of your company. And the thing is, when you have clear goals, your communication will also be clear internally with your team. So that means um, who you are as a company, your goals and your values, as well as externally. So that means all marketing and branding collateral, which should be consistent and cohesive, right? Clear goals equals clear communication. When you have a clear and strong vision and message, it's easier for people to talk about you and share about your business and your offerings. Plain and simple, get clear. Now, as mentioned earlier, your brand DNA typically manifests itself through what we call a brand book, a brand guide, brand Bible, it can be called a few different things. Um, other elements that could be included in this that we didn't cover are target audiences as well as goals and objectives. So these do tend to change a little more often than the points we covered. Um, so they're not always included in the brand book, but it is something that you could add in there. And a brand book really just allows you to filter your decision-making process. And what I mean by that is that you can ask yourself, is this in the best interest of my brand? By going through all of the elements in your guide and ensuring that the decision that you're making aligns with everything that's in place. So not only does your guide um, guide you in all of those business decisions, but it also helps you narrow down ideas, right? It allows you to make decisions more easily and quickly because you invested that time up front. So thinking about that, investing that time up front to really kind of save you that headache and that hassle in the future. And when you onboard new people to the company, you should also provide them with this document. So this can be used as a tool to ensure that all the team members remain consistent on how they talk about your business and how they talk to your customers. Um, and also like um, talking about customers, it, it helps resonate your, your product or service with your target audience and market. So ultimately it really does just help ensure consistent messaging internally and externally. Questions? All right, now let's talk about integrating brands on social media. Okay, so I'm going to start with a high level overview of the role of social media. So first is brand awareness. As you most probably know, a large percentage of the population and most likely your target demographic is on social media, making it a key channel to reach a large audience and build that brand awareness. And brand awareness essentially means talking about your brand in a memorable way so that people recognize you and are aware of your existence. And the second role is to humanize your brand. Um, so customers really value, you know, transparent brands, relatable brands, um, and social media could be that tool to show your brand's personality, right? And to be vulnerable and to be honest. You could do it by, you know, one of the ways is uh, showing behind the scenes content, for example, it's unfiltered, it's honest. The third role of social media is consideration and conversion. So not only does social build awareness, but it also, um, it's also a platform that consumers use to research products, right? Product services, brands. You can also use paid ads to help drive website clicks and conversions. And for those of you who, who may not know, conversions are like um, things like product sales, event registry, email sign up. basically the action of the client choosing to complete the next step that you're asking them to complete to reach your goals. And last but not least is the role of social um, to create a community. So whether it be through influencer marketing, collaborations or other engagement tools, right? There's a ton of fun, cool story stickers and, and engage, engagement tools now on you know, Instagram, Facebook, all those fun platforms. That two-way communication really allows brands to interact with um, followers, you know, build strong, engaged communities, uh, which ultimately leads to loyal customers, right? And if you build that trust with your community from the start, they are more likely to pursue your calls to action in the future. 
Now, a question I get often is, which platform should I be focusing on for my business? And to be honest, the answer is different for every business. Sorry, you probably didn't want to hear that, but it is the truth. And depending on your goals and target market, you may want to be on several, if not all of them, or just focus on one or two. And um, you know, when our clients at Nomad Creative come to us with this question, what we do is we actually provide them with an educated response, of course, based on our research and the findings after conducting um, an audit of their company. So we take a look at their creative and marketing material and we recommend what we think is best, what platforms we think are best. So each platform is unique, of course, and it really allows for us to communicate differently on them. So on Instagram, you'll see videos and curated content that's um, engaging and conversational. It's typically low cost, high impact, um, and you could display short form visual content. Uh, really, it's, it's, it's a good engagement platform with the community, right? On Facebook, you'll see some more uh, high resolution photos, some short videos. Um, you can show your brand personality there a little bit more. And you also have the opportunity to share external articles and links a little bit more easily than um, you would on Instagram, though now Instagram is introducing some new link sharing features. So that's awesome. And then looking at TikTok, which um, many of you know is relatively new in terms of social platforms. However, it was the most trendy and popular social platform last year, especially amongst uh, Gen Z and millennial audiences. It really does represent a great opportunity to engage with that next generation workforce um, and, you know, really just share relatable bite-sized content that keeps people engaged and constantly coming back for more. Twitter, as many of you know, it's short form. People use the platform mainly to share things like news, blog posts, gifts. gifts. Um, it's super fast paced, high engagement, and um, it's frequently used by a larger spectrum of audiences. LinkedIn, primary focus is B2B marketing, things like industry news, thought leadership, connecting with professionals. And then YouTube um, is known for allowing people to share long form format videos. Um, and it often caters to education and storytelling. And it has uh, a, pro a prolonged lifespan al allowing for that extended uh, conversion opportunity, right? How are we doing so far? Good. Give me some thumbs up. Give me some goods. Let me know you're alive. Great. Awesome. Great. Happy faces. Excellent. All righty. Learning lots. Love to hear it. All right. So let's get into a few case studies um, to see how brands have been killing it on social media. Um, so Chipotle was one of the first brands to take a chance with TikTok, but it definitely paid off. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the brand, Chipotle is a restaurant chain. They specialize in tacos and burritos. They're excellent. You should go try them out. <laughs> um, most of its content involves the TikTok trend of challenges. So its first challenge that went um, by hashtag Chipotle lid flip generated over 240 million views on the platform. And the second, which was a hashtag walk dance, was even more successful with 430 million video starts in six days. So imagine how many people are seeing this, it's insane. And to also think that if they were one of the first brands to do this on the platform, it wasn't even really as popular as it is today. So imagine how big of an opportunity this was for them. And by creating this fun and unique content on TikTok, Chipotle became relevant to that younger consumer again, right? We spoke about this being more Gen Z and millennial platform. They announced that their growth of sales was 88%, which is insane, and revenue growth of 14.6% to 1.4 billion for their Q3 in 2019. That might not mean very much to you, but if you want to like look up their stats and see, you know, how much they really did grow, uh, that growth was in part due to its renewed focus on social. Now, looking at Red uh, Red Tube, wow, <laughs> Red Bull, Red Bull on YouTube channel, uh, it has over 10 million subscribers and over 4 million across its smaller channels. 
uh, it's super clear that the brand's video-driven content strategy um, successfully appeals to all types of ad adventure sports and fans. If you hop on their page, you can very quickly see that uh, their videos include things like short documentaries, long form video content. They do uh, live stream events across things like uh, motorsports, music, gaming, surfing. I think they do uh, snow sports now as well. And it's perhaps most famous for its world record space jump back in 2012. So this is the image that you're seeing on the left um, where an Australian skydiver jumped from space from an altitude of over 128,000 feet. I, I don't understand, but it happened. <laughs> so imagine how high that was given airplanes fly on average 35,000 feet. He was at 128,000 feet, literally from space. And that event drew over 2.6 million social media mentions on that day, just that day. And since then, they've continued to draw in on bigger events. On the right, you can see um, a screenshot from last call for Mr. Paul video, and it totals over 156 million views right now. You can search these on YouTube, just type in Red Bull. Um, this video uh, is of this guy, Jason Paul. He is a free runner, which is kind of like parkour. And he gets through security at the Munich airport to catch his flight in record time. And it's actually so creative and so well thought out and kind of choreographed um, how everything was put together. And I really strongly encourage you all to go look at these videos um, after this call because it's so worth it. They're like five minutes or something like that. Um, and the, uh, the skydive jump, just look at the highlights. It's really, really cool. Anyways, all that to say is that Red Bull, Red Bull's um, focus on experimental video um, alongside this subtle branding, right? Because they're not really putting Red Bull in your face. There's just a couple moments here and there where they take a sip of Red Bull or like they have the logo somewhere. It's really not in your face branding. It's super subtle. Um, so between that, some clever partnerships, they've really become kind of like the hallmarks of its super successful social strategy, which is awesome. Now, the last case study that we'll look at is National Geographic with uh, 203 million followers on Instagram. It's the second most followed brand channel on Instagram, second to Instagram itself. And um, what they do different is that they really help people experience the planet and culture as seen by the, their photographers. So they call it, quote unquote, a special unfiltered view. So what they do is they actually give their photographers a level of creative control. And that makes, makes the content really unique. It makes it authentic. Um, it's also heightened by the fact that the captions are written by the photographers. So each post comes from a different perspective. So if it wasn't clear, their photographers are the ones posting on the account and telling their stories behind each image. So it's really cool, which is an interesting perspective too, right? Because we have multiple different voices here. So to summarize, find the platforms that make the most sense for your brand. Every brand and their goals are unique. So they should be analyzed individually in order to discover which platforms are worth focusing on. Just make sure that um, you're separating personal from professional. So if they some way overlap, let's say if you're um, really involved in your business, you just wanna make sure that you ask yourself, is this a good representation of my brand when you're looking at all of your channels? Any questions before we move on? No questions. Great. Making my job easy, guys. All right. So lastly, we're going to talk about the value of branding and why it's worth the investment. And since we all know how complex and thorough the branding and rebranding processes are, I'm sure you can all agree that it takes a lot of time and effort to build a brand, correct? All right, so let's jump into this last quick exercise. So share in the chat, what brand do you recognize in these logo marks? There's a question in here um, from Devin. Any smaller brands to pay attention to on social? 
honestly, probably a lot, but I don't know how much you would know them, <laughs> but you know what? Nike. Oh, you're saying the logos here. Okay. Everyone's shouting out the logos here, but yeah, smaller brands, you know, I'll give it some thought. And what we can do is when we share the video on YouTube, maybe we can mention a few of those other brands to look into or anyone who is registered to this event, I could send you a little list. How does that sound? Awesome. I'll send everyone that, um, Alyssa's contact information. So if you wish to reach out to you, you're more than welcome to do so. Yeah, thanks Devin for that question. All right, so hopping back into this exercise, we're looking at these logos. What are people recognizing? We have Nike, uh, Nike, Louis Vuitton, Rolex, Nike, Oakley, Nike, Louis Vuitton, Oakley, Oakley. Yep, great. Well, you guys pretty much guessed them all, right? We have Oakley, Nike, Rolex, and Louis Vuitton. Now, let me ask you, if you saw someone wearing one of these or any of these products, would you be able to identify the brand? I would assume yes, correct? Let me know. Yeah, everyone would be able to recognize these brands through these images. Well, now what if I told you these products I just showed you were counterfeit? If I didn't say anything, you probably would have never known, right? Well, According to Forbes, in 2018, counterfeiting was the largest criminal enterprise in the world. Sales of counterfeit and pirated goods totals 1.7 trillion per year, which is more than drug and human trafficking. Now think about why the person that bought a pair of counterfeit Nikes bought them. If you pull the Nike swoosh off those shoes, I bet that same person wouldn't buy them. If you took the Rolex crown off the watch, that person probably wouldn't buy it. So why are people interested in wearing specific brands? If you ever question the value of what's being designed and what the public's perception is of a logo or a mark, think about this example. People want to wear these items because of the feeling the experience that comes with wearing a recognized brand because of the community that they will be a part of by owning them or the trends that they'll get to experience for wearing them. If you build your brand and your logo well, it's going to be repre the representational mark and touchstone for your business for decades. I'll say that one more time. If you build your brand and logo well, it's going to be the representational mark and touchstone for your business for decades. And that's all I have to say. Thanks guys. That's the end of the presentation. So I'll take any questions. I know we don't have too much time left. 